Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, Mark, I want you to know it was a pretty damn good paper. <laughs> it really was. Um, and, uh, and one of the few I actually got that had a business uh, a perspective on it, which is really good. I'm going to say some things about the role of business and, and, and climate change as well. Um, you probably all recall that back in December, there was a lot of hype about an agreement that was achieved in Paris. Um, and um, that, in fact, for the first time in history, virtually every country in the world, 195 of them, plus the European Union, actually agreed on something at one time at the same place. And, you know, governments can't even agree within themselves, much less with each other, on what time zone they're in, you know, <laughs> what day it is. There are all kinds of things they can disagree about. So it is a remarkable uh, achievement. So what I want to do is to first just spend a couple of, a couple of uh, moments um, reminding you a bit about climate change itself, what we know about it, what it means, and what we're doing to address it. First of all, and I won't PowerPoint you very much with slides that have, have text on them, but, but uh, just it's, climate is the 30-year average of weather, right? It's what you pack, it's what the information you need to pack your suitcase to go someplace, right? If you're going to, um, Antarctica, <laughs> you plant differently than if you're going to the Sahara Desert, right? The climate is different. And so climate change is the change in that 30-year average. And it can be temperature, it can be precipitation, it can be what, whatever measure uh, uh, you, you, you wish to have. You add all that up and you say, well, the climate of Washington, D.C. in the springtime is, it's kind of cool, it's in the 60s, the cherry blossoms come out at that time, and so on and so forth. And one of the major things that determines what the climate of the Earth is are the gases that are in the atmosphere. In fact, it's the trace gases, because 99 plus percent of the atmosphere doesn't affect the temperature of the Earth at all. In fact, for carbon dioxide, it's only four hundredths of one percent. But that's up by 43 percent over what it was before we started putting more in. And there are many other gases we've put in as well. So the basic idea, just to remind you, of what's called the greenhouse effect was actually figured out in principle in 1827 by a French physicist. It was actually calculated with paper and pencil, no calculator, no computer, no iPhone, no nothing, uh, by a Swedish chemist uh, named Svante Arrhenius in 1896. He published a paper where, you know, it's amazing. With what was known and everything, he, he is within, first of all, he got the sign right. You put more of these gases in the atmosphere and it gets warmer. And he was only off by about 50% on his estimates of what it would be if we were to double carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from what we think it would be today. Now, he went on to be the, win the first Nobel Prize in chemistry, but not for something important like this. It was for some trivial thing about the conductivity of salts in solution or something like that. It was just really pretty boring by comparison. So the way this works is that um, the sun's light comes in through the atmosphere, visible light, that's why we, we see it, so we know it comes through. Some of it's reflected away by clouds and some by the surface of the earth. Some of it gets absorbed, and when it gets absorbed, it heats up the earth and warm bodies radiate heat, right? You know that from a light bulb and all kinds of things. You, you go near it, you can feel the heat. So that gets uh, radiated back into space, but these trace gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and other things, uh, absorb that radiant heat. And you can see here, some of it, they radiate back out to space, and some of it, they radiate down. And what's actually quite remarkable is, on a given day, we receive twice as much heat from the radiating gases in the atmosphere as we do directly from the sun. Now, of course, if we turned off the sun, it would all go down. But, but the point is, while the sun is shining, we get half as much from the sun as we get from these other gases. So that's the, that's the, that's the basic game. And so what, what um, Arrhenius figured out, he said, well, if we increase that, the world will get warmer. And he calculated how much it would get warmer. And he, um, um, oops, what happened here? I hit the wrong button or something. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you know, if this had been done 100 years later, in, uh, in, uh, it would be called the hot car effect, right? When people skeptical to me about the greenhouse effect on the earth, I say, do you believe in the hot car effect? 
And we all know about the hot car effect. You know, it's 70 degrees outside, inside the car it's 130, and how did that happen? And it's because the glass lets visible light through, it's absorbed by the seat covers and the dashboard, it heats up, and the glass blocks the radiant heat from going out. So you hear these terrible stories about dogs dying, in fact, even children dying in cars during the summertime when somebody forgets and leaves them out there. I was just went into the store for a few minutes. So it can be, the hot car effect can be quite serious. So now that I have the attention of all the animal lovers, I'll move on to the rest of the uh, presentation here. So has carbon dioxide increased? And the answer is it has. About the time of my junior year at Williams, a PhD graduate from the University of California in San Diego named David Keeling, who had gotten his PhD by measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere very accurately, was sent to Hawaii to sit on top of Mauna Loa volcano, where there was an observatory, because it was the cleanest air space that there was, because for 6,000 miles to the east, with the trade winds coming that way, there was nothing, nothing but open ocean. So he could really sample the true concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so he did, and what he found was this remarkable pattern of oscillations, which is the annual breathing of the northern hemisphere. Plants sucking up carbon dioxide in the spring and summer, decreasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, releasing it in the fall and winter. So that's the, the biological part of the Earth, and the upper rise is the economic activity of the Earth, driven by burning fossil fuels coal and oil and natural gas, and deforestation, and degradation of soils. Probably half of what you see in this record of rise is from deforestation and soils, and the other half is from fossil fuels. So has that affected the temperature? Well, here's the temperature graph. Yes, it's affected the temperature. The temperature has gone up, and it goes up and up and up, uh, there are these funny bumps and things. Those are all the big bumps up or El Nino years we now know, even going back in history when we didn't even know what an El Nino was. And the dips down are the La Nina years when uh, the heat is taken back in by the Pacific, o the Pacific Ocean. The high ones are when the heat comes out of the Pacific Ocean once or twice a decade. It's a very funny thing. Nobody knows quite how and why it happens. But look at the rise and it keeps going up and up and up. And that top one up there is last year an all-time record by a lot, and this year is going to exceed it. In fact, we will exceed the one degree Celsius rise from pre-industrial levels this year, and you'll see in the treaty, we're not supposed to go above two. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, what are the consequences? Well, the most dramatic is the melting of Arctic sea ice. This is a picture of, or a simulation of what it looked like in uh, September of, tw of 2012, which was the year of the, of the um, uh, smallest extent by the end of the summer of the Arctic. Now, that's problematic for several reasons. It's not just that we're gonna have to patrol more naval vessels up in a new ocean. By the way, it's a whole new ocean. I, I'm doing some work in Iceland right now, and, and there's all this talk about the new ocean, right? And uh, we, we, for the first time in human history, there's a new ocean that is going to come in, and it has all kinds of implications. So this is also, the yellow line is basically what it was in 1979, the first year we had satellites to measure this. And um, uh, this loss means that sunlight in the summertime is no longer being reflected from this. So the Arctic is warming up twice as fast as the rest of the Earth. So the Earth is warming up, it, 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 and this is twice as much. So it's, it's really uh, an amazing increase. This is the trend in Arctic sea ice. You see the, 2012, the 20, 2007 dip and the 2012 dip, they're extraordinary, and they come bouncing back, but look at that line, it's a pretty, I mean, you couldn't draw a better straight line through this if, if you had uh, made, it, made up the data, I mean, it's quite something. And so 2015 is back, heading down below, and by the way, last year, it was the, minimum, the, the least amount of maximum ice cover last March in 2015, and this March, on I think it's March 24th, it was smaller than that. So we have a new record, smallest extent of the Arctic ice. This has all kinds of consequences, but um, um, ice is melting in Greenland, in Antarctica, at a tremendous rate. 
there is a, uh, you can see down here, a, a calving of a, of a huge uh, iceberg. There was an observation, if you go online and look at chasing ice, there's a wonderful kind of five minute video of something like uh, four cubic miles of ice cracking off at one time. And it must be terrifying to be across that fjord, taking pictures of that and then looking down to see what am I actually standing on here? It would be a little nerve wracking. Uh, and if all of Greenland were to melt, by the way, Greenland's melting three times faster than it was in 1990. And in fact, it is, um, if it, it were all melt, we'd have 23 feet of sea level rise. Sea levels are rising, and these are the various projections out to one meter, but just last week, a new study concluded that in fact, we're more likely to get to two meters by 2100. This is what one meter would do to the Northeast. Virtually all parts of the Northeast would be, have some serious underwater problems, specifically in the cities. And we've already seen a tenfold increase in the amount of coastal flooding in, in the last uh, about 30 years along the East Coast cities from Miami up to Boston. Precipitation increases a lot. This is what Boston looked like last year. This is a picture I took outside of my office in the uh, Bedford campus. Uh, it was amazing. Precipitation is snow as well as rain. And if the temperature's below freezing, you get snow. If it's above freezing, you get rain. And there's a certain senator who needs to understand that who <laughs> never got it right. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is the intensity of these events. Um, how much rain falls in the top 1% of events? Well, between uh, 1958 and 2012, in the Northeast, 71% increase in that. That's, that's a changed climate, right? It's not that climate change caused that. Climate change is a result of changing the composition of the atmosphere and everything else and the reflectivity of the Earth. And so once that happens, these are the changes you get. So more intense events. In Pakistan, really severe flooding in 2010. The most intense Pacific tropical storm ever recorded happened just last December, Hurricane Patricia. It also intensified more rapidly than it's ever been seen before. So these are all things that are happening and um, they have, they're causing us all kinds of problems. We're all familiar with Sandy. And um, this is what the New Jersey coast looked like. Insurance companies are pretty convinced that it has something to do with climate change. And um, these are people who didn't want the Army Corps of Engineers to put sand dunes in front of their house because it would ruin their view of the ocean. They now have a terrific view of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Less dramatically, here north of Boston, this is a storm surge. Again, you know, you'd like to be close to the water. There was a woman interviewed on TV as we were bailing her out and paying for getting it all fixed up. And she said, oh, it's so nice to live next to the ocean as long as somebody else is paying for the damages. On the other hand, the droughts are more intense where there are droughts, and this was California uh, just recently. Um, and then an amazing thing happened. Could not get agreement time after time after time. In 2009, a total collapse of the negotiation system. It took four years to get things back on track again. It was thought that maybe the UN system was totally broken. Two hurricanes happened while negotiators were negotiating. Both hit the Philippines. And at that point, the Philippines said to other developing countries, we all have to do something. And amazingly enough, we broke through this barrier we had been facing that developed countries get, have to do something and developing countries need to develop and make more emissions. I said, no, we've got to find a way to develop that doesn't cause that. And then we had a help from this gentleman here. In the face of the emergence of human-induced climate change and social exclusion and poverty, we joined together to declare that human-induced climate change is a scientific reality, and its decisive mitigation is a moral and religious imperative for humanity. This was the, um, the encyclical that he wrote. By the way, the Pope's a man who walks the walk. I don't know if you saw. The Pope has just ordered the new Tesla III for the Vatican. <laughs> Not only for himself, but for the entire Vatican core. Everybody will be driving Tesla 3s. I don't know how Leon Musk gets, a, gets, gets a, um, a, a marketer like the Pope, but he does it. So here was the negotiation. It was wrapping up, and there was great self-congratulation. Christiana Figueres from Costa Rica was, was a prominent person, probably the most influential in getting this done. Um, there was a, a while the negotiations were going on, no plan B, and as Ban Ki-moon of, of the UN said, there was also no planet B. Uh, 
There was a lot of pressure on to get this right. This is something I really love, 3,000 activists spelling out climate justice and peace in Paris. You can see the Seine River, L'Etoile is up in the upper left-hand corner. It was really quite impressive. Did we make it? No, we didn't. Without the agreement that was put together, we would have gone to something like eight degrees Fahrenheit. With it, we will only go to six degrees Fahrenheit. That's also way too warm, much warmer than the goal, which is to stay below 3.6 degrees. So what are we going to do? We're going to, uh, fortunately, we have, in addition to what the governments did, 154 companies in the U.S. joined ahead of time to say, let's do it, go ahead. We had cities and regions led by Jerry Brown of California, uh, Premier Couillard of, of uh, Quebec, and uh, they represent a huge amount, 55% reduction uh, by 2050. And we had corporations, huge numbers of corporations. And um, they uh, committed to uh, 80 to 100% reductions in their emissions and or 100% of their renewable energy. And at the Apple shareholder meeting just this year, Tim Cook announced that they were 97% solar operated in the United States and 100% in their supply chain in China. So these corporations are really walking the walk. They're really making it happen. So where were the colleges and universities in Paris? Well, um, they weren't in Paris, uh, but there were, were, were at least some back here, Williams, talking about its plan. So I think my conclusion is we will know what the Paris Accord has been truly transformative when Williams becomes one of the first colleges in the world to educate future leaders at its campus that does not contribute to climate change. If corporations can do it, I'm sure that colleges and universities, and Williams in particular, can as well. Thank you.